Greetings, everyone. <laughs> we'll have to edit that part. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Holistic Human Optimization Show. I am your host, as always, Ronnie Landis. And uh, wow, we got some kind of episode lined up for all of you today. I am joined once again by my dear friend, Mr. Sacred Steve Adler. We just did a part one in a two part interview series on the science and mastery of the mind and heart connection. Um, absolutely incredible deep dive. And we were originally gonna talk about one of both of our favorite subjects that's near and dear to our heart, which is the astonishing truth about the world's favorite food, which of course is chocolate. What else would it be? Um, certainly not broccoli or lettuce, although we love those, those are great. And uh, we just decided that this was such vast territory between the two of us, especially for Steve, who's literally one of the premier pioneers actually in this field, um, that we had to just do an episode completely dedicated to it. So here we are, and uh, in cacao fashion, I can already sense the zany, wonky energy that's about to come through here. So um, man, there's so much that I want to say and can say, but let's just, uh, let's just, yeah, let's just, you know, set this off, you know, chocolate, cacao. What what immediately comes to your mind, Steve, when you think about that? I think um, there are a couple things, actually. I mean, I, I immediately, of course, get the energy of, of you know, Willy Wonka. Yes. Uh, because I, I grew up with Willy Wonka, and I've seen... Um, you know, both versions of the movie, read the book, of course. Um, and, you know, just this, this idea that um, there's this special food on the planet that, you know, all kids love um, and all people love generally. And there just seems to be sort of this mysticism around the food. I, I, don't, I don't really um, know of any other widely accepted food that has this sort of energetic mysticism behind it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I, you could sort of maybe say, oh, wine can be spiritual because it's, you know, obviously referenced in the Bible a lot and, you know, different things. You could even say, you know, the original tobacco, you know, like rustica tobacco, that the, the original native smoke was a very mystical, um, you know, substance. But, you know, these things aren't really, you know, sort of uh foods that are eaten by all people all walks of life all ages and so there's this and, and those foods are sort of um you know they've got these sort of um you know tread lightly around mm -hmm. them sort of energy right like hey these are they're powerful medicines they but you know you're it, sometimes you're playing a little bit with fire right you got to be careful of these other plant substances with cacao there's none of that with cacao, with cacao, it's just like, mm -hmm. it's like going to an amusement park and having, <laughs> you know, it's, it has that energy. So yeah, first and foremost, I think, you know, that's one thing that comes, comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For me, another um, thing that comes to mind is just this um, sort of deep uh, reverence for um, the plant and its origins and its origins with respect to um you know the native peoples who who cultivated it and discovered it and um they obviously tuned in their shamanistic traditions tuned in to the the power of of this food of this plant and they held it in huge high respect obviously and so i always bow deeply to that heritage and and i deeply respect it and on um, and so that comes to mind all of that history all that culture um it is there and then um obviously what comes to mind are just kind of the modern scientific um discoveries about cacao its nutritional benefits its complexity on um, its you know its ability to be a delivery mechanism for uh foods uh and and herbs and medicines and nutraceuticals um, and then it also has for me kind of this deep sort of um, 
now this is a personal thing for me, more of a deep kind of spiritual um, thing. Because mm -hmm. for me, for me, it, it symbolizes the spiritual heart of man, woman, and um, it, it, you know, it, it's sort of a food that that's connected to that because you know historically cacao has been exchanged. Well, you know, I guess in the Mesoamericans exchanged it in at, during weddings, at weddings. Right, right. You know, so, so basically, it's it's always been connected with love, um, with the exchange of love, you know, with the flowing of love. Um, and then, of course, it has this beneficial uh, beneficial effect on the actual human circulatory system, the you know, the heart, the arteries, the blood. So um, all of these things come to mind you know, immediately when I think of cacao. Mm, that, that's, that's, that's brilliant. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go really deep with you in a number of different directions in this, this interview. And when I think of cacao, I think of all of those things, 100%, like you and I definitely get it, you know, on a level that I think we want to do this interview particularly so we can help other people get it beyond the, the surface of like the chocolate bar, even the raw chocolate bar to really understand the myth, the lore, the magic, um, the legend that is cacao. You know, the word cacao, um, to my understanding in etymology, is the oldest word still used in, in our language that was originally used in that form, right, cacao. Um, not cocoa, which is a British term that for people that couldn't pronounce cacao, so they called it cocoa or cocoa, which is you know slightly offensive. So I advise nobody to actually use that term unless you're talking about a processed alkali, um, which is a different thing. Um, so you know, I want to I want to just kind of share a few things because obviously, as you know better than most, um, I'm a deep, deep lover of cacao. I think I've done at least. 50 or 60 lectures on cacao, just something that I love. It's a fun thing for me to do just to take a side skirt around my normal talks and, and really just do a deep dive into the, the lore and legend and myth and, and entertainment of chocolate and like all the, the incredible properties that it has. I, I really believe from a nutritional perspective, it probably is pound for pound the most nutritious food, which is actually a nut in the world by far. When you study the, the mineral and analytical composition, the phytonutrients, et cetera, et cetera, um, which I want to dive in deeper with you. Um, but there's, there's one thing I want to share because you mentioned Willy Wonka and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And I propped this up on my screen so I could read this because that book, Charlie and Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl is absolutely a classic. And as you know, um, I spent a number of years working on a book called The Hidden Messages in Chocolate, kind of a spin on Masaru Moto's The Hidden Messages in Water. And uh, I'm really inspired to finish the book. It's about 20% done. It's been sitting there for about three years, and I'm ready to get back in it. And, and uh, I, I, you agreed to write the forward for it, so I'll be giving that to you soon. Look, I want to I wanna read one of the quotes that came out of that book in Chapter 16, an iconic chapter, where basically Willy Wonka discovers the Oompa Loompas. So uh, just, you know, let, let's just go, I'm going to read just a couple sentences that I thought were really fun. So he says, look here, if you and all your people will come back to my country and live in my factory, you can have all the cacao beans you want. I've got mountains of them in storehouses. You can have cacao beans for every meal. You can gorge yourself silly on them. I'll even pay your wages in cacao beans if you wish. Willy Wonka speaking to Oompa Loompas upon finding them in the jungle, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Chapter 16. So first of all, obviously that's fun, but what I find really interesting about that is that book was written like in the 40s or something, right? That was before, you know, the Western world really, you know, in America in particularly, that's the advent of really the industrial food supply that's when more the industrial age of the food you know our, our processed food and all that kind of thing started to come into being and we had processed chocolate really becoming a big thing nobody really knew what cacao was but somehow Roald Dahl wrote c-a-c-a-o he actually knew what it was and he said that you can't have chocolate without cacao I don't know where that comes from I don't know where he got that from 
but I just find that very interesting. And I would love for everybody, if you're in, entertained by this conversation, go pick up that book and watch the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with Gene Wilder. Cause uh, you know, it, it's just, um, it's a magical thing. Yeah, it really is. And um, I love how on, um, you know, in the book and in the movie, um, there are all these great moral lessons, um, you know, and, and ultimately um, the lessons um, are all, from my perspective, connected back to sort of the, some of the topics that we were discussing in our prior podcast, which is all about, um, you know, living, living with a pure heart, you know, um, trying to get out of the ego mind. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to, and, and, you know, the, the Oompa Loompas are constantly, you know, with their poetry and so on and so forth, you know, serving up these lessons uh, <laughs> to the children and to the parents uh, throughout the whole book. And, and the greatest thing is, you know, really the, the, the winner, you know, the ultimate winner of the, of the grand prize of the golden ticket is Charlie Bucket, who, of course, you know, has a real contrite spirit, you know, real humble heart, just pure there, just want, wanting, wanting to really, you know, just do the best for all. And it's just such a great demonstration that that, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that's the message ultimately is, is, you know, don't follow all these ego trips, you know, that, you know, all the other kids and, and the parents were following, you know, follow your heart. And, and, right. you know, and the greatest test, of course, at the end is he was even willing to give up the whole thing because he thought himself that Willy Wonka was on some ego trip. Mm. But mm -hmm. Willy Wonka wasn't, you know, and uh, he was just kind of testing everybody else. And so that's just, and, and so that's the energy of cacao. You know, cacao has this, um, it, it's basically like this mystical non-dualistic energy. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, my main message in this realm of cacao to the world is that um, let's, let's, let's tune into that energy of cacao, that original energy, um, and let's take cacao back to its natural um, way of being honored, consumed, respected, so that we can tune in to that energy and live by that energy and hopefully overcome the powers that um, sort of twisted cacao just for profit. Yeah. Um, you know, especially the huge chocolate companies who unfortunately even to this day um, are um, fostering in so many ways by their inaction um, child slave labor in West Africa. Yep. Um, there was an article I just posted on my Facebook today or yesterday um, that just came out. Just it was a, I think a, Was a New York Times or Washington Post article mm -hmm. um, about still after two decades. I mean, the big chocolate companies of the world committed in writing that they were going to eliminate this this issue um, by 2005. It is still not done. Yep. yep. After two decades, that was in 2001, almost two decades. Wow. And, and even right now, they're saying maybe by next year, they can get 70% of child slave labor eradicated in that region of the world. I mean, and, and basically, when you, you know, these companies make billions and billions of dollars. And over the many, many years combined, they've only invested $150 million into eradicating this huge issue, which is a drop in the bucket to them. Right. So, and, and at, you know, at one point, the, the U.S. Congress was trying to keep them accountable. And then they talked the senators and the Congress people out of making it a law as far as labeling is concerned, because they knew that would be, that would really hurt their bottom line. So, you know, I just bring this up because it's really us, up to us as, as small producers, um, people who are, you know, kind of on the ground, um, people who want the best for all to make this known and really broadcast it wide and far that it's really morally, it's a moral imperative. Yeah. People vote with their dollars 
talk to their Congress people, say, look, you know, we re let's, we're going to we're now going to boycott Hershey, Mars, Nestle, you know, all these other huge companies. We're going to boycott their products because they've been sitting on their hands for so long because they don't want to hurt their their bottom line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why, you know, I'm, I, that's part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, is, is to yeah. be, you know, be a little bit of a, a platform, but it's people like you, Ronnie, who can take that message out to a, a much broader audience throughout, through your, through your speaking and your books and your, and, and it's just, it's a huge thing that that's so huge. Yeah. I mean, Steve, first of all, thank you for bringing this up. This was on my notes of things to, to talk about. Um, I have an entire section in the book that I wrote about four years ago called The Dark Side of Chocolate and goes into exactly those articles and, and what's going on in West Africa and Ghana and, and, and you know, just the atrocities that are happening in this particular field. Um, it's a super critical thing to understand because when you talk about, and, and I want to, I'm, I'm putting, I want to put a little bit of a bullet point because I want to circle back around to this um, on a particular other um, related topic in terms of uh, the quality and certain plants that are being used, hybridized cacao plants. I want to get to that part too, but I want to kind of push it out a little bit. But I just want to say that this particular thing that you're bringing up is so key and essential. It's no different than when we talk about Monsanto and genetically modified foods and glyphosate contaminated foods and, and all, the, all the crazy atrocities that are more in the light, but when it comes to the world's favorite food and the number one cash crop in the world, um, if it's not that, it's, it's coffee or something, but they're, they're like right head and head, I'm sure. Um, this is such a huge, it's just a, such a huge issue just to know about and know that when you're purchasing chocolate, it needs to be fair trade at minimum. And even then it might, even then we need to start, we need to actually go beyond that, um, which is exactly what sacred chocolate is doing. So let me just, pu let me just put a little bullet point on that because what I want to do with you is I want to go through your origin story and I want to go through how did sacred chocolate come about because a little context for everyone listening this man that i'm talking to sacred scientist steve adler he is actually the pioneer of the entire raw food movement him and david wolf but steve's actually the one who figured out who cracked the alchemical code of how to turn a cacao bean into a cold pressed chocolate bar so the entire raw chocolate movement the the origination of it actually comes from these two individuals in you in particular, Steve, and all your scientific knowledge and somehow you getting bored with being a rocket scientist or whatever that, I want to hear that story and in, in going into this, which I'm so thankful for. So let, let's, let's just go there. How did, how did sacred chocolate get started? What inspired you to start it? Um, let's start there. Okay. Well, I guess an origin story, I guess I'll start from the very beginning. Um, you know, I, I uh, uh, in the in the early '90s, um, I was uh, really involved in uh, network marketing um, uh, as a side uh, business. Uh, uh, besides working as uh, an, aer an aerospace engineer on the space station program, I was working for McDonnell Douglas in Huntington Beach, and I was doing a lot of Fortran programming. I was doing um, basically. Um, um, uh, not to get too off the track here, but I was doing a lot of computer modeling of um, thermal control systems on the space station. So specifically, um, the space station has, of course, a lot of little rocket thrusters attached to it. And these little rocket thrusters um, keep the space station in the proper um, attitude as it's in orbit. And these little rocket thrusters um, basically use liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as um, its fuel, the, the fuel. And, um, and you, when you're in orbit around the around the Earth, um, you're experiencing extreme temperatures. Um, in the, on the sun side, you know the, the all the materials are experiencing temperatures in the hundreds of hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, on the on the dark side, you're experiencing temperatures in the you know minus hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. And that's happening every 90 minutes. So it's a huge thermal stresses. And so you have to control everything because these, these materials can't handle that thermal stress, especially those, those tanks holding that, that liquid fuel because it would just blow up. It would crack, it would blow up. 
So you have to con you know, control this with insulation and geometry and special surface coatings and things like this. And so I was involved in all the, um, you know, in that whole program of, of doing computer modeling to make sure that temperatures stayed within limits and all that sort of thing. Anyway, so, but I, I um, a, f a fellow engineer um, and actually a, a, a friend of mine from Stanford, um, who was also on the space station program from McDonald's Douglas Center in Huntington Beach, um, he got involved in network marketing, got me involved. And so we, you know, it got us into an entrepreneurial spirit and you learn a lot, you know, you learn a lot about business, about sales, about, um, you know, um, you know, interpersonal communication, uh, spiritual principles, success principles, and all that sort of stuff. And it really got me uh, to think independently. You know, I, I started to think outside the box, right, as you hear. And um, I came across Tony Robbins' book, his first one, Unlimited Power, and I read that. And, um, you know, that's really what got me into the whole raw food thing. Actually, it was Tony Robbins, because in his book, uh, that book, I think it was chapter 10, he talked about how all these great philosophers throughout history were like vegetarians and how that was a great thing and how he was into that. And, and, and Tony, in a lot of ways, got his start through Harvey and Marilyn Diamond, who wrote Fit for Life, Fit for Life 2. And he was a big proponent of their message and would speak uh, on their behalf. And, and um, he said, he, one thing he said in that little chapter, he said, hey, um, you know, go and buy a juicer and start juicing every day. And, you're, and you'll probably experience all these detox symptoms. And he said, if you don't have enough money to buy a juicer, sell your car and um, go buy one, it'll take you a lot further down the road. And that always stuck with me. I was like, wow, that's, that's probably some deep wisdom. So I did that. And sure enough, you know, after juicing and going into this vegetarian vegan mode, I then became vegan and I was juicing all the time. And he called it. I was going through all this detox symptoms and I'd never had any sort of like hay fever detox symptoms my whole life. And I thought, wow, there's, there's got to be a lot of truth to this. So that got me into raw foods. I started reading a lot, experimenting on myself a lot. And um, eventually met David Wolf in the mid-90s at a raw food potluck. And he and I became friends, um, really connected around the whole subject of the uh, Ormus materials, which is a whole another conversation, which I won't go into right now. But he and I uh, stayed in touch. And, um, you know, around the late 90s, early 2000s, he discovered that you could eat raw cacao beans right out of the pot. He, he was going to Hawaii a lot. And his friend in Hawaii had turned him on to raw cacao beans. And he was like, wow, this is amazing. You can eat them. And so David started to import uh, from South America raw cacao beans and starting to sell them on the internet. And he used to send them to me. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really like the taste of them too much, but I put them in smoothies, you know, based on David's um, research that these things are super healthy for you in their raw state. Because basically at that point in time, I hadn't eaten chocolate in years. I, I, I got into raw foods in like 93 and it, I hadn't touched chocolate for probably seven years. And, um, and so I started, you know, putting these raw cacao beans in it. And then David wrote this book, Naked Chocolate. And it came out in like 04. And I read it. And I went to a big chocolate party of his in New York. And, uh, you know, people were just going like crazy and having a great time. And I thought, you know, there's something to this. This seems to be like a real, a real trend that's going to take off. And I was in the computer business that, at that point. I, was, I had left McDonnell Douglas, and I was deep into the computer business. And um, I wanted to do something else. Um, I was not really doing the network marketing thing anymore. And so I started um, a company distributing raw foods on the internet. And I thought, how cool would it be to actually start making a product for that business? And so I thought, right at that time, it happened to be, you know, raw chocolate was a big buzz. I thought, I wonder if you can actually make a raw chocolate bar. So that information combined with just my personal spiritual path, um, which I've been into for over 20 years, which is basically the, um, the work of Glenda Green, Love Without End, Jesus Speaks, The Keys of Yeshua. Those are the two main books that I've studied for a long time. Um, that information just combined with my love of raw foods and my um, relationship with David Wolf and him bringing about this information about raw cacao, all that sort of stuff started to coalesce along with my motivation of wanting to actually produce a product into the idea of, I wonder if it's possible to actually make a raw chocolate bar. Like, is that doable? I mean, 
who's, you know, and so as I got researching, playing around my kitchen, I started figuring out that, yeah, there's no reason to cook or roast cacao. It's, it's not necessary. I see at first I was thinking, well, maybe there's some sort of chemical reaction that takes place and it, it and that's necessary for the, um, you know, the bud, the oils that are in cacao to, to cause the crystal, crystal, um, crystallization process to cause the tempering to occur. But no, that wasn't the case. Luckily, luckily it turned out that roasting, roasting it um, did not alter the oils in such a way that was necessary for tempering. In fact, I would argue that it's probably, it may be easier to temper chocolate in an unroasted state um, than in a roasted state. I haven't proven that to myself because I don't really play around with roasted chocolate. Um, but, um, but as I discovered that, I thought, well, might as well do it. Might as well make raw chocolate un using unroasted cacao. Um, and, um, and so I, I went at it. I, and I approached David at that point and I said, hey, look, do you want to actually, you know, start a company? Do you want actually, are you interested in doing this? And he said, yes. And so we started to create Sacred Chocolate. That was around 2005, 2006. And so that's kind of the origin story of how I, you know, got into this. It's quite an amazing story when you factor in pretty much everything you just said in your, your original profession. It's, it's quite a, a novel approach to say the least. And, um, you know, the, the, so I want to, I want to kind of probe just a little bit deeper for, before we keep moving on. Um, I'm wondering like your, your area of research, like what you had to pull back to actually figure this out. Obviously we know like in the 1800s, the conch machine was created in, in, um, in Europe where they actually figured out, okay, we can actually press this into the powder and, and like actually temper it. And, and obviously it was from a cooked roasted state. Before then in, in Mesoamerica and ancient Mexico, they basically had um, a stone matate where they, they grind the beans down into a paste. And then they have the wooden molinillo where they're just spinning it and dropping it into the, the cup and to create the froth and that was the first blender by the way everybody that's where the first blend tech or vitamix comes from look it up the wooden cacao molinillo so you know we could go back to that but i, I like my i like my blenders well well um you know basically um i i really you know i guess in college and um afterwards i really excelled and, and really was interested. I have a, I have a, a natural um, intuition, you could say, around the subject of heat transfer and fluid mm -hmm. mechanics and ga gas dynamics. Um, those were all in, in, in both undergrad and grad school. Um, those were my favorite topics. I excelled for some reason in, in thermodynamics, heat transfer, gas dynamics, fluid mechanics. And it's so funny because you know, you probably can't get a more uh, a more complex fluid than chocolate. Oh my God, the real the, they call it rheology. The rheology of chocolate is ridiculously complex. In fact, my buddy was uh, here last year, and and he and I went to college together, and we did um we did a fun summer uh, project for NASA when we were in college together, and uh, he's a genius, and and we we were we were thinking about like you know. The basic equations for, for fluid mechanics are called the Navier-Stokes equations, and they're very complex differential equations, and they, they, there's, no, there's no analytical solution for them. What that means is you've got to use very powerful computers to do approximate solutions to these equations, and they, they call it finite differencing and finite uh, element uh, solutions to these equations. And, and, you know, and this is even on the most simple fluid, like water or something. And he and I were just kicking around that, like, Chocolate will never, and you you can you'll never find a solution using the most powerful supercomputers in the world. It's so complex you'll never find any sort of even analytical, definitely not analytical, until Navier Stokes are solved, which that's one of the Millennium Prizes in mathematics. There's like seven unsolved mathematical problems that they say are like the most important ones to solve. Well, the net solution, the analytical solution of the Navier Stokes equations is one of those millennial patents you know, millennial prize um, mathematical issues. Anyway, so uh, so we were like, yeah, even with, you know, quantum computing, it probably, you know, you'll not solve the, the chocolate equation. The chocolate Navier-Stokes equation will never be solved analytically or probably even computationally. 
So, um, and, and I'm, a little, I'm speaking a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there are probably, you know, uh, chocolate scientists and mathematicians out there trying to crack the code right now. <laughs> so I, I, it's not like I, but just in my own thinking, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but, but anyway, um, the alchemy of making chocolate is the same as, as peanut butter, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I usually tell people, I say, if you want to make chocolate, just think about making peanut butter. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So on, on a very simple uh, way to look at it, it's just a matter of, you know, smashing the seed on to the point where you're, you're pressing the oil on um, the cacao butter out of it. And, yeah. and then you're, and you're reducing the particle size to the point where your tongue can't detect it and you're basically just keeping it all intact you're mixing it back in so it's basically it's kind of like pulling the oil out of the seed and then putting it back together mixing right. it all up and you've got chocolate the only thing about chocolate is it's because of the 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 different crystalline structure of the actual oil um you can do this you know post process called tempering which basically is all about um uh, kind of um, filtering out the crystals that you don't want. You do that using mm -hmm. just a, a mixing and temperature control process because mm -hmm. the different crystals uh, form at different temperatures. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of kind of using temperature mixing to filter out the unwanted crystals and keeping the crystals you want to get to the point where when it does solidify, it, ha it has a nice organized crystalline form. And that basically produces on um, the finish and texture of, you know, what people recognize as chocolate, right? Kind of hard, snappy, shiny, kind of like that. Right. Um, but you don't have to do that. I mean, uh, most people want that, like here, this, you know, this piece of chocolate here, right? It's been tempered. Um, and, um, and this chocolate actually, not only is it this particular chocolate here, not only is it um, unroasted, but this is unfermented as well. So the fermentation, isn't yeah. even necessary. So yeah. this, what I have in my hand right here is actually um, just stone ground, 100% cacao. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, it, the cacao, the seeds are, are, are taken out of the pod and immediately um, dry completely with the fruit pulp. So no fermentation at all. So they're immediately dry. So, so basically, you don't even have to ferment the seed to get tempered chocolate. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the oil that's just in the raw seed itself, unfermented, is in the right, um, it's, it has the right chemistry and the right mechanical properties to create a tempered chocolate. And so this, this bar actually doesn't taste anything like traditional chocolate. It tastes very tart and tangy, mm. like like the fruit of of the of the cacao pod because all the fruits in here, and the fermentation is actually what starts developing those those chocolate notes that people recognize as chocolate. So anyway, um, that's kind of the basic you know idea of making chocolate. And so you know when we start cho making chocolate, we decide David and I decide that we wanted to make it on using stone as the grinding process um, because um, we believe basically when you're using any of these machines, whether they're super high tech um, or low tech, uh, we use very low tech old fashioned stone grinders. But if, if you use the high tech machines, um, you're always going to get some sort of particle in the chocolate ultimately from the machines. Like a heavy um, particle? Yeah. So, so with, with the big machines, you're going to get, um, iron or stainless steel or some sort of metal basically yeah. um, they try and pull a lot of it out with magnets but ultimately you can't pull it all out with magnets when the when the particle size gets so small it's hard to pull it out of out with magnets it doesn't really for some reason I don't know if it's a mechanical thing or a magnetic thing I'm not sure but it's hard to pull the real real super small particles so you know most chocolate uh, has metal in it, very small percentage. It's not going to hurt you. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's down in probably parts per million. Um, but there are microscopic pieces of metal in most industrial modern chocolate. Now, in our case, it's not that. It's actually granite stone. So here in this chocolate, there are microscopic pieces of granite stone. So from a health and philosophical perspective, David and I decided that we wanted to create chocolate kind of using this old fashioned method because it was more natural. It seemed like, hey, is it more natural to kind of eat, say, dust from a stone? Or is it more natural to eat kind of steel from like 
you know, metal from like, you know, whatever. So that's why we chose that, you know. Um, and basically this whole idea of conching is, is really um, the idea of um, doing a grinding um, and mixing and, and shearing process for a period of time. Because the more you do that, um, the more you get even particle size distribution, uh, the more you get full and robing of all the particles by the oil, um, and um, the more that all the volatiles are, 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 are basically evaporated off the chocolate. Basically what happens is, you know, when you ferment chocolate to get those kind of chocolate notes, um, it's not really the, the seed, the kernel, the nut really, it's not actually fermented. What happens is the fruit pulp ferments and that fruit pulp fermentation creates acidic acid. That acidic acid starts to seep through the actual husk of the nut, and it's the acidic acid that has a chemical reaction with the seed and starts to create those chocolate notes. Um, and so, um, what happens is, you know, when you start grinding it, all that acidic acid starts evaporating off. So, you get a lot of, you know, kind of acidic acid gas and various related gases come off and so the conching is all about you know working on getting those off and again it's about mixing and it's about um getting the particle size correct mm -hmm. and um yeah all, all that sort of stuff is is what gets the chocolate smooth enough to when then you can temper it and have a really nice tempered bar um basically to make really high quality chocolate it it takes some time um even real, really high tech equipment you know, you might be able to do it in eight hours or 12 hours, but with our low tech equipment, it takes days. Um, and in some cases, weeks, um, you know, we've got bars that are very, very complex that have crazy ingredients like our Amazonian with like even tree bark in it. You know, that, 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 that bar takes weeks to make. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a, that's a multi-week process. Mm. Um, so, you know, um so that's you know and, and and people can make this at home nowadays you know you can buy all the small little stone grinders and tempering machines online and somebody who's into it can totally do it at home and learn there's so many you know videos online it's really easy to actually make really good chocolate at home um it's it's not hard at all actually mm -hmm. uh, absolutely i want to um i want to i want to go back before we go forward because um, when I think about when I first got into the raw food movement, you and I were talking about this last time we, tr we attempted to get on this call, but we got blocked, the internet, whatever. But we got into this whole banter because, you, you know, we've known each other for the last 10 years when I really got full on with the raw food mission and the superfood mission. And you were reminding me that it was pretty much cacao that got me in the door. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. It really was cacao that really opened me up. You know, juicing and, and salads was amazing, but it was really cacao that almost created this carrier wave that I just rode, this momentum that I just rode and started doing all these chocolate events. And um, it created a huge momentum in the in the immediate community, I remember. It was like it was like a lightning bolt. And um, one of the things that me and uh, me and I go, our good friend Hoy, who was like my my roadie at the time for years, we'd just go on the road together and um, we would get bags of sacred chocolate, like 32 at a time. And we would take whole, we'd take like your Ormus chocolate and we would drop it in the blender with like our Shaga tea base. And, and just, that would be our chocolate paste. It would be an entire sacred chocolate bar and just drop that thing in there, blend it up. Um, you know, it, it yeah, it's it, just so much fun. There's so much fun that can be had and, and it can change your life. It can, this can seriously change your life in ways you don't even understand. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that was, you know, part of my motivation to um, start making raw chocolate was that, you know, raw foods in general changed my life so much that um, in, in so many different ways, I, I can't even explain physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, it was, it was a sea change. And so I thought, wow. I'd love to get this information out to people as much as possible. And, and so uh, I, I, you know, I would do the raw food potlucks and give little lectures here and there. 
Um, but then when this whole idea of, of starting a business around it um, came about, uh, you know, I thought, gosh, what better product to kind of turn people onto raw foods uh, than chocolate, raw chocolate? Because like I think I mentioned, you know, getting on the green juice bandwagon is kind of like climbing Mount Everest, right? It, it's, it's a process to get your habits changed to the point where like you're into g drinking green juice every day. Um, you know, to have a massive, you know, physical transformation. But raw chocolate's like going down the slope in a toboggan. It's like, woohoo! And, and, it's, and it's so easy. It's so fun. And like you mentioned, you know, you, it's the ultimate on um, like party drug. I mean, in, in that sense. I mean, not it, because it's safe, it's fun, and it doesn't, it doesn't actually tweak you out sideways in any way. It actually just kind of, keeps you on this nice steady slow glide upwards and effortlessly i mean especially that this chocolate in particular oh my god what i love doing with this chocolate personally is putting it in the blender about one part chocolate two parts warm spring water blending it up it's just it comes out to be this almost like a mousse and it's it's one of these things where especially since it's unsweetened and it's just sweetened with the fruit of the cacao it's just for me, it's not like I don't get addicted to it, but I just keep wanting to take little spoonfuls consistently. And I, as I notice doing that over about an hour period of time, I just get so naturally high. I, it's just like I have permagrin on. You know, it's like, you know, when you have this permagrin, you're just kind of lit. But it's not like you're, you know, you know, drunk or high on pot or, you know, having some sort of psychedelic experience it's just like you are just oh that's what it's like and so i thought wow what a great stepping stone to turn people on to raw foods um you know as you get into raw foods it's it's that right there is a journey yeah. for most people um because it's it's not it's not that easy to um if you're if you're especially if you're raised in um uh, you know, on the sad diet, right? Standard American diet. Mm -hmm. And if you're kind of raised in our modern culture with modern food technology and fast foods and all this sort of stuff on um, it, it's, you know, you can do these short sort of short stints on raw foods and many people do, and they, and they really feel the therapeutic uplifting effects in so many ways. And it kind of turns them on. It's like, Whoa, this is incredible. I want to do this all the time. But if you actually try and do it all the time, for most people, not all, but for most people, it's kind of difficult. And so it, for, for myself, I found it actually took years and even decades yeah. to, to evolve to the point where I could just be totally stoked on raw foods. Um, and, and so, you know, and I remember hearing once that, um, you know, and so I, basically, I don't want to digress too far, but I want to say this. I do remember hearing once, I forgot if I read it somewhere or somebody told me or something, but it was basically this idea that somebody had once sent to like some, you know, Hindu kind of guru sage type person, right? Like, hey, I want to become vegetarian because like, you know, that's the thing in India, like, you know, to be vegetarian, right? And the, and, and the guru was like, that's wonderful. You know, I think that's a good idea, but, you know, take 10 years to do that. Wow. Well, yeah, you know, and, and, and it's like, and I, and as the more I thought about the more I realized one of the main reasons is because food is so fundamental to our life in ways we don't realize, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, one, in one way, like what's more intimate than that, which you put inside your body. Most people are unconscious. It's like, wow, I'm putting something inside my body. Like, if, <laughs> like, if, like, like seriously, like if you inject something in your veins, are you going to be pretty like conscious about what you're injecting in your veins? Right. I mean, but you basically, that's kind of what you're doing when you're eating something, sure, you know, you're, sure. you're basically injecting something into your veins. And so people, so people don't really, most people eat unconsciously. That's why I love the title conscious eating by Gabriel cousins. Right. Yeah. Cause it's about, wow, how do we bring consciousness back to an awareness, you know, back to the whole diet food arena mm -hmm. of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so one of the things is, you know, it's so connected with love. Food is intertwined with love so deeply that because of that fact alone, it's, it's not easy to unravel. Wow. It's, it's not, there's so, and just to give you an example, I, I say this sometimes, 
you know, if you were fortunate enough to be breastfed, well, that's probably one of your very first experiences of like your f- physical love from your mother yeah. is being breastfed. So there's such deep, deep, deep psychological connections and love connections associated with feeding and food, right? That you, and, and all the social interactions, right? And all the service, all the love that goes into it. So all that sort of stuff, it's not, you just can't throw it in the garbage can. Right. There's so much love tied in. There's so many exchanges of adamantine particles that we kind of talked about in the last podcast. You can't just like, just toss it. You can, you can, of course, but it's hard to maintain because eventually it's going to come back around. And you're going to go, wait a second. I just kind of threw out literally part of my life, like your love. And it's not, you just, it's not workable. It's mm-hmm. not actually part of the quantum physics reality in which we all exist. Wow. And so that's, that's an important thing to realize. But, you know, turning people onto raw chocolate is a first little, it's a great stepping stone in the direction. It's a great like, oh, okay, wow, raw chocolate. Well, why do I cook food? What's the reason for cooking? How did humans get into cooking? Yeah. You know, what are the pros and cons of cooking food? Mm. There's some pros to it. It's not like it's all evil or bad. There's no judgment around it. I mean, everything serves its purpose for sure. So that's, that's an important thing to realize. But for me, the raw foods I realized was actually a, a, a natural sort of fasting. I don't even think I knew what fasting was. Right. I, I didn't even know what fasting was until three, at least three years into, into, um, my whole raw food experience. Uh Like I'd never, I didn't, I'd even, I'd never even heard of fasting. I think maybe in my experience up to that point, which is now in my late twenties at that point or early thirties, I I may have heard of the word fasting and kind of intellectually knew what it meant, but I, I didn't, I, I thought maybe it was some spiritual thing or just some, you know, like hunger fasting and like people are trying to make a statement. And just, I, right. you know, right. I, I had no idea that it would have any sort of physical like benefit or anything like that. Right. So when I was doing raw, like plant foods, I was a raw food vegan. Um, you know, I, I, I was a natural fast and I didn't know it. And so I started experiencing all the benefits of fasting. And so that was what was kind of really opening me up. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I came across somebody who had done a long water fast and that blew my mind. I was like, wow. Right. And so then I got into fasting and that was a whole, mm. a whole another, you know, path and, and, and experience. So, yeah. you know, one thing leads to another raw chocolate is the great, uh, the great gateway drug into the world of healthier diet and fasting and spirituality. <laughs> it's a great gateway drug to get off drugs. That's for sure. I've seen, I've seen more people get off drugs through chocolate, raw chocolate, and mixing that with just like on one note, you brought up that party that you went to in New York with David Wolf. Well, coincidentally or synchronistically, as you, as you know, you know the story. Me and David were sitting at one of the the longevity conferences um, a little while back, and uh, hold on, did we freeze? dude okay okay we're back okay yeah so um as you know uh this was 2011 2010 i think i was sitting behind the stage with david wolf we had become friends over the last couple years and um i'm sitting there talking to him and he just tells me like he just like something hit him and he just looks right at me and he's like he's like it's on you now i was like what do you mean it's on me he's like you gotta you gotta go out there and do the events and you gotta do the chocolate parties this is the first time it even dawned on me i mean you and i did that one party in the bay area that chocolate event i don't know if you remember that yeah i remember that that was fun yeah, that was great. But it didn't dawn on me to actually do a series of chocolate nightclub events. And this was when I just got into LA. And he's like, yeah, you're the one you got to do it. So I was like, okay, I guess I got to do it. So literally within a week, I set up my first chocolate nightclub event in Sherman Oaks, uh, Los Angeles, we had like Romania Dean Thomas doing like herbal herbal consult consulting we had kyle cease come out and do i bribed kyle cease with a bag of chocolate because that's when he first got into 
into into chocolate and i literally bribed him with a bag of chocolate because i didn't have any money um <laughs> and, you know like sites in the band and and all these you know all these people we just kombucha we had like raw chocolate tonics and i throwing chocolate at people like left and right i mean it was crazy and um that you know i i just think about that and um where was i going with that i think um well wherever i was going with that that was worth mentioning but um i think i lost my train of thought there's so many yeah things. That, yeah, yeah i think let's see what were we talking about we we're talking about um um you're talking about david wolf and about how he kind of yeah. all of a sudden so that, you know so that was just like an interesting synchronicity point but so i guess my point with that is that that opened up a whole new world and the the amount of people that got brought together i mean if we were talking about like let's have a wheatgrass enema nightclub party that probably wouldn't have gone over so well that's right but all, you know but all of a sudden you have all these people from different fields different worlds coming together under the similar umbrella having the best time ever completely getting activated oh yeah it was the drug addiction thing so like so many people from hollywood would come out and you know i i can just i just remembering so many people that got turned on to this and all of a sudden they're drinking non-alcoholic drinks and they're getting into juicing and then now they're getting into organic uh, whatever alcohol and then they're getting into chocolate and all of a sudden a year later you see them and they look completely cleaned up and um so as far as like chocolate being the gateway drug to get people off of drugs and get on to juicing and all that kind of thing there's there's nothing i've seen to be better than that um yeah yeah, no, it's true. And that, that, and that, again, that was one of the main uh, inspirations and motivations for me to figure out if uh, a raw chocolate bar was possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, let's, so I want to, so I backed up, I want to move forward now. I want you to share with everybody, um, not your proprietary process, but like a little bit of information on what makes sacred chocolate so unique. Because there's something I wanted to bring up with you when you're talking about the, the slave trade and all that. There's, there's different varieties of cacao, right? There's the three main varieties, the Trinitario, Trinitario the, the Criollo, and the Forestero. And then there's subdivisions of those, those, those varieties. Then you have like Arriba Nacional, which um, is like a fan favorite among most of us. Um, and then there's another variety called CCN51 which is a hybridized genetically engineered version of cacao, which in my research is more prevalent in the industry. Even quote unquote organic chocolate bars are being grown with this highly inferior, potentially um, contaminated form of uh, CCN 51 cacao, which is, is just very, it's basically an abomination. It's not even the actual cacao tree. It's just these little bushes and they grow it super fast and it's definitely not ethical. So I'd love for you to maybe share the, the variety and the quality of where you source the cacao so people have an understanding of like how important that is and how actually rare proper sourcing is in the cacao industry. Sure. Well, first of all, um, we use um, Ariba Nacional, which is you know one of the heirloom cacaos uh, recognized by the um, Heirloom um, Cacao Preservation Project, um, and uh, you know we source mainly from Ecuador, um, a little bit from Peru. Um, we source a little bit. Actually, this cacao here is from Sri Lanka, and we source from um, David Wolf's farm in Hawaii, uh, aka Noni Land. Um, and all of these uh, cacaos that we're sourcing from um, are all purchased above fair trade standards. They're all certified organic. Um, they're all coming from small co-ops or small farms. Um, and they're all um, uh, shade grown. And that's so, so, so key. Um, I mean, flavor is subjective. So, you know, what tastes great to one person may not taste so great to another person. So that's just a matter of like, you know, hey, does that cacao appeal to you on a, from a flavor perspective? point of view and that's debatable ad infinitum but as far as the ethics around it that i would say is not that debatable um, and uh the most important uh issue right now um, on this subject is the massive deforestation going on um, around the world um, mainly in west africa but also in ecuador also in peru and this has been confirmed by satellite uh, photographs 
also in Indonesia, uh, Indonesia. Um, th these are areas that are being massively deforested by what you talked about, which are, are um, um, you know, hybridized uh, cacao such as CCN51. Um, and the reason um, cacao farmers uh, are motivated to, to do this is because of money. It's an economically driven thing. Um, you know, a, a plant like CCN51, which is just a cacao tree um, that's been hybridized, has certain characteristics that are more profitable for the farmer. Um, for instance, you know, the cacao is resistant to a lot of different diseases. Um, the cacao um, is, uh, produces a lot, the tree produces a lot of cacao. You know, the pods are big, they hold a lot of seeds. Um, and the cacao can grow in full sunlight, which is beneficial because um, what that means is the cacao can be more densely grown. Um, in other words, they can clear the forest and they can grow, so you're, so you're producing more cacao per square foot, if you will, or per acre or hectare. So that's the challenge is that um, it's economically driven. The hybridized cacaos, which are causing deforestation, are, are, it's all economically driven. And unfortunately, it's really hurting the ecosystem. It's hurting the animals. Um, you know, um, I was recently interviewed, I guess it was last year, um, uh, on a, a local show here. We posted it on our sacredchocolate.com website. You can look it up. But um, uh, a, a woman, um, uh, her name was Atel. I forgot her last name. Um, but she, uh, you know, went undercover, um, risked herself in a lot of different ways to document um, this deforestation that's going on around the world. Um, she actually talked to poachers in West Africa saying, hey, you know, uh, you got what, what's happening here in this in this area, you know, all the whole cacao growing region. And the poachers are saying, you know, the, the, the natural ecosystem, the forest here has been devastated by cacao. As a result, most of the animals are all gone. They're, they, 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 they're either left or they're dead. And so as a result, we're, we're not in the poaching business anymore, which, you know, I mean, who, you know, it's not like you want people to be in the poaching business, but it just, it shows how bad the area is impacted by cacao, which is so sad. Again, this is economically driven, you know, kind of like the, the slave, the child slave labor, economically driven. So unfortunately, this is one of the downsides to our economic system. And, you know, unless you can get the proper checks and balances in place, you're going to run into these issues on a continual basis, unfortunately. If it's not cacao now, it'll be something else 10 or 20 or 100 years from now. So it comes down to a change in heart. Humans have to wake up and change their hearts and realize that, hey, um, I'm, I'm not in this just for the money, just for the bottom line. I've got to make sure that everything else is ethical and correct and feels right, according to my heart, before I'm even concerned about the profit. And so that, that's just a huge, huge, huge thing. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and so I would say to people out there, of course, you want to buy certified organic, certified fair trade. Um, um, you know, there's a logo for, um, um, I forgot the name of it. It's, it's uh, um, Forest Stewardship. Um, it's like a little forest, uh, forest stewardship um, certification. You, know, you want to look for all of these logos on your bar at a minimum to make sure that you're eating, you know, ethical cacao, but there's still no guarantee. Um, so ultimately you have to talk to the chocolate maker and say, where is the cacao coming from? <laughs> With the big companies, according to the article I, that just came out yesterday, pretty well researched, they don't even know. They, they, they can't trace a good portion of their cacao. And of course they do that on purpose because they know, you know, if it were traceable, it'd be traced right back to, child slave labor, right? So this is, this is stuff that's a big, big concern, you know, and, um, you know, and, and it, it's not just in the cacao uh, industry. This is, you know, happening in a lot of different industries as we are well aware of, you know? And so it's, it's, it's about a spiritual awakening, um, you know, and, and, you know, I, I guess besides our ingredient sourcing, what sets us apart is, the message, I mean, you know, why we make our chocolate in the shape of a heart, you know, it's, it's really about the love. It's about more than anything. Um, it's about the love and prayer 
and consciousness that goes into the food. You know, I mean, that's really what can revolutionize health more than anything. Ultimately, it's love. Love revolutionizes everything fundamentally. When there's a major change, it's actually a shift in love that's taking place. Like I said last time on the last podcast, life is love in action. That is the definition of life. So, you know, if you want to follow life, you're really following just where love is going. Wow. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the whole key. And so, you know, you direct your love by your intentions and so, and your prayers and your, and your conscious, um, you know, thoughts. And what you eat, right? That's right. You know, cause you know, the, the food has the love in it. That's right. Right. The, the food actually has the love in it there's a the, the love remember at commands the adamantine particles so this, you're you're right? right i'm thinking it and you're saying it like so just on the tempering process is it possible that sacred chocolate and other particular chocolate brands maybe some of our friends that we know are tempering their chocolate with the adamantine particles of love of course that that's a reality that's just a quantum physics reality. Uh -huh. As yeah. soon as you, you put love on something, intention on something, things change on a quantum level. Yeah. There's, 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 in other words, Higgs bosons, if you want to call it, you know, are, 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 in, are in that, right? We had, years ago, this is a long, 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 long time ago. Um, I was at, uh, actually, it was a Ross Spirit Festival, and a woman came up to our booth. I never met her. I didn't know who she was. We were just, you know, handing out free samples and stuff like this. And there were a lot of, you know, I don't know, a handful at least of other, you know, raw chocolate makers uh, there present. She, she gave me the biggest compliment. She came up and said, you know, there's something about this chocolate. I, I just, um, I have a feeling, I don't know what it is, but, um, you know, I just, it's, 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 there's something different about it. And I was like, oh, well, thanks. You know, I took it as a nice compliment. And she's like, no, no, really, I, you don't understand. I'm like a real, I'm a professional empath. I'm a psychic. I've been on TV. I'm like, I'm really, really sensitive to this stuff. I said, well, it makes sense because I pray over the chocolate. My intention is that love goes into the chocolate so that that love enhances anybody who's consuming the chocolate on a very subtle level. Maybe it's a major level, but it's, it, it could be physical, emotional, spiritual, new epiphanies, new insights. But that's the intention. That's my love. That's my prayer going into mm. the chocolate. That's mm. the most important thing actually um it really is um and and she picked up on it right away and and this is a woman who's you know she was been doing what she's doing for decades and so i believed her i you know i said hey you know well you're you're tuning into the fact that i'm putting a lot of love into it and um that's whatever you're eating I, it doesn't matter what you're eating that's the most important first step you know is to make sure that the the love and the prayer is there and you know, and then that really, and when it's not there, then um, you're subject to a lot of uh, potential traps and downfalls, actually, you know, yeah. as far as eating disorders, as far as uh, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. things like that, you know, uh -huh. um, and even health, health issues. I was just thinking, Steve, when I was thinking about the CCN 51 varieties of cacao, you know, I'm sure you've heard um, throughout the years, every once in a while, there will be someone that... Um, has raw chocolate, quote unquote raw chocolate, because a lot of the raw chocolate out there is not actually raw, but you know it's it's the best they they know how to do. But it's not there's no regulation around the word raw, right? Um, so I'm I'm I, I was thinking about like the sourcing of a lot of these cacao powders or cacao butters or paste or whatever people are using is very likely an inferior quality that can actually create an allergic and allergenic effect in some people's metabolism for whatever reason. I don't know. It's something to do with their immune system. But one of the interesting things I've noticed is when I get those same people and I put them on sacred chocolate, they don't have that reaction. So I, I just wanted to point that out. I don't know if I've ever told you that, but I've, I've noticed that across the board. Wow. Well, that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know. Um, but I'm not surprised. I mean, here's another instance. This is years ago. Um, many years ago, um, in fact, um, it was uh, um, the Tree of Life, Dr. Gabriel Cousins at the Tree of Life, he became a customer of Sacred Chocolate. Yep. And they actually just placed an order the other day. Uh, we shipped them out a, an order of Sacred Chocolate. Um, but years ago, he actually, it, it, uh, we, didn't, we didn't ask him 
we, we, this was just voluntary on their part. We just got a random email one day from somebody. I could probably pull it up in my email database. This is like over 10 years ago. And um, it, it came through somebody else at the Tree of Life. And, some, and they were saying that Gabriel, Gabriel Cousins, I guess, you know, he's a very spiritual person. He, and he, he has a lot of different techniques that he uses in, in healing and his natural practices and all this sort of stuff. And unbeknownst to me at the time, I guess he's really um, a top level kinesiologist, you know, amongst other things. So he can, he can do a lot of um, muscle testing and, and that type of energetic um, diagnostics around things, you know, mm -hmm. and he had done a diagnostic on sacred chocolate, on all our flavors. And he said um, around a couple of them, um, if I remember right, it was one that we don't even make anymore, but there was like, I think it was the Sun Sweet, um, the Zero Point Mint, the 100%, the 99. He was saying that um, these things tested like on his scale or whatever, like a nine and or, and or 10, or even one was over 10. And he said that like nothing that he tests ever tests at that scale. Like nothing. It was like, it was like this weird thing. It was like, he was like, he's, first of all, he had never tested anything that was an 11. And, and even like the nine or 10, not, he said in his realm, nothing ever tests that high, not even close. Wow. And I was like, wow, that is crazy, crazy, fascinating, weird. Like that's weird. It, it's like, you think that there are other things out there that would test in uh -huh. his as a, as a whatever, a, as, as, a, as like a healthy thing or a high vibe thing, or I don't even know his whole testing mechanism. And this is just, I could bring up the email actually, probably I should try and do that. But I was, I was flabbergasted, honestly, blown away. But the only thing, again, I could, I could hearken it back to is the fact that the reason I got into this is really from a pure love, pure heart reason. I, I, never got, I never got into this. Believe me, when I was back in the computer business, I made a bazillion way more money than <laughs> this business. This is truly a labor of love. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things where we're like, how are we going to keep the doors open this month? That's been going on for, for a long time, for, for years. And the, I, there's other energies. It's not just me. I, I, I want to say that very strongly. This is not just my love and my energy. Involved. Yeah. There's other forces here. It's also David Wolf's energy, but it's also, I want to just say other beings, whether it's Yeshua, whether it's um, St. Germain, whether it's Sai Baba. We've got a lot of different pictures up around here. I mean, Amma, I mean, we've got, this is like, you know, sometimes it's kind of like a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a sacred space, obviously, a little bit of a shrine. So, you know, there's, I think that there are other energies here supporting us is what I'm trying to say. I, to me, I'm just a steward at this point. Yeah. I think I, think I was, maybe, I have a feeling I maybe had some sort of past life as, you know, connected to some sort of alchemy or alchemist is, uh, is, yeah. Yeah. Is, my, is my, you know, I, I, I had one person once tell me that. You know, so, and I, it feels right to me. So it feels like I, I do, do have this, you know, I, I, I can just, you know, at this point I can just write a formula down on a piece of paper and pretty much know how it's going to taste. So I, I really do have a, a real strong intuition when it comes to formulation. It's, it's a real strong suit, but honestly, it's nothing I went to school for. It's, I think it's just, like I said, a past life kind of soul talent that's come through in this lifetime. That's the only thing I can, I can think of. But honestly, I, I'm really a steward of this. I'm, not, I'm a steward to the cacao god and all the other spiritual entities that are supporting us and wanting us. Because honestly, David Wolf and I, when we started this, we we're like, wow, we're of service to the cacao god. Like he has this whole story about how, whether it's on some sort of psychedelic trip or some sort of spiritual <laughs> thing that goes on, but the cacao god somehow communicated to him saying like, hey, you know, it's your mission now to you know, trying to right all the wrongs out in the world around cacao. Wow. There's so many wrongs around it. Wow. And so David was like all about righting the wrongs. And so, you know, because I was good friends with David, I was like, sounds like a pretty good mission to me. And I was already into raw foods. 
and I already had these other, these other paths and other motivations. So I was like, feels right, should do it. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a big thing. It's, it's really about the energetics. It's the, intent, the original intention about sacred chocolate was to right the wrongs in the world around cacao. Ooh. And, and, and that is why we're probably still alive to this day, because it's a miracle, honestly. Um, you know, it, we, we really are at, at the mercy of the marketplace and the mercy of our loyal little fan base. It's the only reason. And every summer, it is unfortunately dead around here because everybody goes on vacation and people just don't eat as much chocolate in the summer. And so, you know, we need all that, all the little help we can get. By the way, on this subject, I just want to throw it out there to the universe. Um, we are looking for investors. I mean, I sacred, about, oh, you were reading my mind, Steve. You were reading my mind. So yeah, I mean, sacred chocolate basically is is here to um, you know to we want to get to the next level. I mean, I don't feel like, and David's the same way. We don't feel like we have to always be owning sacred chocolate or always um, you know being uh, operating sacred chocolate. We would like to turn it over to the next group person or group of people who can take it to the next level um of course holding the quality and the intention and the formulas and the brand intact as much as possible but i mean we we would like to we would like to do that i mean it's that time now it's really it's truly that time where that that we were we're we're wanting that so i put it out to the universe for anybody who may be listening well, we'll see what we can do about that because that was literally the thought that I was having <laughs> when you were saying this. And I wanted to mention everything that you're saying is so incredible and so spot on because we started this this entire interview out with the whole Charlie Bucket, Willy Wonka kind of morality and the whole embedded. And in my book, I have all that, by the way, everything. I have an entire sub chapter on Willy Wonka and the whole kind of like mythos and breaking down the whole like moral structure and and really what chocolate represents is a, is the return to grace from the fall from grace so cacao was the central form of exchange it was the coin of the realm it was the holy sacrament it was literally the central um like iconic uh thing in the entire medicine wheel of many many um cultures that were passed down over thirteen thousand years just that we know about um, but then it kind of just got bastardized and got hijacked. And, and then it went from this, like this Faustian bargain, right? Even like we found out, I found out in my research that Johann von Goethe, who wrote Faust, was a chocoholic. And Rudolf Steiner has some weird quotes that I somehow pulled out and decrypted about chocolate. And this stuff keeps showing up in all these great mystics and, and, you know, Albert Einstein. It's the weirdest thing ever. Um, but then, you know, coming back now, it's really like chocolate is the rags to riches. And that's what that, that movie symbolized for me is that there's always a chance. There's always just one more roll of the dice, right? And you, I've told you from the day we met that you were the personification of Willy Wonka. And now that you're sharing this with me, it's like clicking in even more. It's not just because you have the whole suit and you do the whole thing, but it's actually your heart, Steve. You're literally the, the heart-based embodiment of the iconography that was embedded in that movie. It's the innocence. And I think you're right. Like there is some kind of spirit that's like, it's like angels pushing you, right? It's like, just pushing it along like this isn't the end like just keep going just keep staying with it because keep rolling the dice because this thing this thing is has its own time yeah i and and i've always realized that years ago i would say that you know sacred chocolate has its own energy it's not it's not it, it has really ultimately nothing to do with me i'm a player in it i'm i'm i'm, I'm one of the actors in in the play if you will but it's the play itself is the play and it has its own energy and really on um, the play, you know, the show must go on as they say. Right. And, and so that's, that's really where we're at is the show must go on. And it's really key, um, especially in this day and age, there's so many polarities, you know, there's so much all kinds and, and cacao is really about non-duality. It's really about, you know, when I think about Willy Wonka on uh, that energy, honestly, is the energy of love, of compassion, of, um, of non-duality, of fun, you know, of, of acceptance, 
you know, um, and so it, it, it really what it comes down to is, you know, all our choices in life are, are kind of little spiritual tests, right? Every, every choice we make in life is a spiritual choice. And that is really um, displayed really well in, in the book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the movie, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It's so well displayed that, you know, everything there is obviously that spiritual choice, but what's the moral choice, you know? And so, you know, that's, that's the energy of cacao. Cacao is this kind of universal um, energy of non-duality. Um, and I, I love that about cacao, you know, cause that's kind of what I stand for, you know, if, if, if especially, um, well, you know, as anybody gets to know me, that's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of that type of person. Um, and so that's, uh, and that was probably one of the reasons why I, I was so attracted to cacao unknowingly at the time. There's uh, there's two quotes that are the headline of a chapter in that book, the hidden messages in chocolate. It's the chapter called the enchanted world. And there's two quotes that I, I use to open that up. One of them is, and they're both from Charlie and the chocolate factory, um, by Roald Dahl. One of them was that, but there was one thing that the grown-ups also knew, and it was this, that however small the chance may be of striking lucky, the chance is there. The chance had to be there. And I just remember, I just returned to that, the beginning of the movie where all the rich kids were just buying up all the, the candy bars and going crazy and they're getting the ticket and little old Charlie bucket, man, just the roll of the dice, the roll, just the, the most unlikely character. And then there's one more quote, um, which is you should never, never doubt something that no one is sure of. There you go. It's these little messages, man. And it's all because of cacao. I, I, it's all because of this one incredible, gateway i feel like um you know i know we're rounding out to the, the finale of all this and there's still so much we could talk about we didn't even really talk about like the actual nutritional aspect of this but we just went in i just wanted to go deep with you on things that people never even heard of never even considered and and really bring more of the magic and invoke that energy because that's really what cacao did for me in my life and it just opened me up if there wasn't for cacao i don't know I don't know, because the thing about healing and transformation is that it needs to be fun. It needs to be entertaining. If you're not being entertained while you're healing or while you're in your transformational process, it gets heavy. You know, it gets, it gets heavy. There's only so many alkaline substances I can keep pouring down my throat until it's like, man, I want to do something else. So um, the, the enchantment, the fun, and the, the return back to natural magic. And I think that's kind of what ultimately cacao and the, the whole iconography of it really symbolizes and why so many great writers and literary and artists are, were on to cacao because it invokes this quality of magic, but it's not like a psychedelic. It has certain chemistry that's very similar, but it's not, it's almost like you can pierce through the veil, but it doesn't, it doesn't push you through the door. It kind of just opens the door a crack so you can pop your head in, but it doesn't push you through the door like ayahuasca or something. Yeah, indeed. It's like I said, it's, it's just this gentle feel good food. Um, you know, back in the, in the uh, 1700s, um, at one point there were um, over 2000 and uh, you know, so that just, shows you how powerful cacao is and was and and that time is about to return i think cacao uh, is a is i think cacao is about to uh once again take center stage um it it it, it has had it it's 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 uh it's day in the limelight in the past and i think it's about to really come back strong on um, you know it, it, once this knowledge that we're talking about is brought forth uh, because this knowledge really isn't, it's not shared in any sort of mass marketed or commercial way. Right. Uh, it's not, it's not taught in schools. You know, it's, it's not, you're only going to hear about it on maybe social media and then it'll inspire somebody to maybe go deeper. But um, I think that's about to happen. I think cacao is going to take center stage again on, um, you know, along with all the other great, you know, foods and beverages out there, but it, it'll be, like I said, it's got this, um, like David Wolf used to say, it's got this free hall pass. Basically, <laughs> cacao, cacao is, there's no barrier to entry. 
right, and, right. That, you know it's not there's nothing illegal about it you, you can anybody uh, can eat it unless you're like of course allergic to it and even a lot of allergies can be overcome i mean i i used to have various food allergies uh when i was a kid i was allergic to cashews i was allergic to apricots but i outgrew those but even um you know, as an adult, I was severely allergic to poison oak, like ridiculously. I could almost just look at poison oak and it would go systemic on me for like six to eight weeks. Complete wow. nightmare. Complete nightmare. Wow. But I was blessed with this technique called Nambudrapad Allergy Elimination Technique 20 years ago. N-A-E-T. Anybody can Google it. N-A-E-T. And it's just a matter of reprogramming your nervous system. So using acupressure and acupuncture and bringing the allergens into your um, auric field and using it to reprogram your whole nervous system so your, your, your immune system, your nervous system doesn't overreact to a perceived threat. So I, there's even hope for people who are allergic to cacao. That's what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like we mentioned before, the, quali the quality and the sourcing of it and, and what you're putting into it. I mean, man, there's, there's so many, I, it's like, there's so much more we could dive into, but we've really given, we've really given people, I mean, I can imagine so many people are just like, what the heck just happened? Like what, 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 what just occurred here? This was like, unlike any other talk on chocolate I was expecting. Um, and there's so much more to dive deeper. Obviously David Wolf's book, Naked Chocolate, that was, that is a, that is a classic. That is that is so far the premier book I would say in terms of synthesizing the history, synthesizing the the alchemy, bringing in the raw food and the superfood additions to it, um, bringing in the the myth and the legend, the lore. It's beautifully illustrated. It's just a really fun book to read over and over. And I'm gonna finish my book, uh, the hidden messages in chocolate, and um, excited to finally finish that. I think everything has its own timing, right? So it was interesting. Like I, I, I had 80% of it done. Incredible, amazing information. Incredible research that I had to do, and um, it just I just stopped. It just kind of like I just kind of put it on the back burner, and then all it's like you said, it's like cacao came and emerged. Then it kind of just like didn't go away, but it just kind of like subsided just a little bit. And now I feel like there's this whole new momentum. So I'm like, man, okay, it's my turn. Now I got to bring, I got to bear the fruits of my labor and my passion and my research to the new generation. And maybe that's what's happening. So that that's exciting. That's really fun. Yeah. I'm excited for you to do that too. And I just want to mention, because a lot of people who on this call may not have even uh, heard of raw foods or raw cacao or, you know, some people come up to me at shows and like, well, isn't all cacao raw or isn't it all like what, what, what is raw cacao? Isn't I, what I didn't know. Do they cook it? Do they roast it? Most people don't even know where it comes, where chocolate comes from. They don't even know that it, it's, it comes from a seed of a fruit that grows on a tree in the tropics. It's hard, you know? So I just want to say that why raw? Well, uh, one reason is just like the, um, you know, say like you look at, say, an orange. If you cook an orange, you lose a lot of the vitamin C. If you roast cacao at high temperature, you lose a lot of that antioxidant, similar to vitamin C. Um, and so that's one reason. There's other subtle chemistry that's very heat sensitive, such as phenylethylamine. You lose a lot of the phenylethylamine, for example, if you cook or roast chocolate or process it at high temperature. Um, uh, and then there's carcinogens. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you know, roasting things at high temperature can create certain carcinogens. One, which is well known, is acrylamide, which you know now the state of California, Prop 65, you know, a lot of things have acrylamide in them because um, most nut seeds or starchy foods that you cook above 250 degrees Fahrenheit for any extended period of time are gonna. It's, that's a natural acrylamide producing event. So, you know, should we minimize carcinogens? Of course, yes. So again, that's another reason why raw chocolate. Basically, it comes down to, you know, minimally processed food. Um, you know, we're pro even though some people argue that, you know, we evolved on cooked food to whatever, pull ourselves out of the jungle. Or, yeah. Well, you know, I, I personally believe I we that. Survived. Well, I mean... You know, you could say that cooked food gave us the, the tools to, to, you know, climb into the very cold climates, which probably right. makes sense, right? And, 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 and uh, you know, and cook animals and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that, right? I mean, the con is, you know, well, just like it says in the Bible, if you eat, if you eat animals, I'll take your blood and trade, right? So, 
I mean, it says it right in the Bible, in, the, in, in Genesis. It says flat up, straight up. People conveniently overlook that when they're giving their sermons, though. Right, right. I mean, it, it says straight up. You, 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 you take the blood of animals, and I take your blood in return. Yeah, it's right there, plain day. Wow, I've never heard any pastor ever quote that before. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, um, you know, so anyway, so, so sure, I mean, we're very adaptable, obviously, we can, we can adapt to just eat about anything, you right. know, uh, we can adapt to not eat. I mean, it's, <laughs> ultimately, it's love that nourishes. Remember, it's ultimately, it's love that nourishes. Food is just a compensatory kind of um, love function, if you will. Um, so that, that's, um, you know, I, I personally believe we're, we're kind of hybrid creatures. I think we're probably a cross between like ETs and, you know, apes or something. And so as a result, you know, our diets are still in a process of figuring out like evolution, like, okay, what works, what doesn't work. There's a lot of trial and error and a lot of trial and error has to take place for your own unique genetics and your own body and your own state of health and, and, right. and mentality and spiritual evolution so um you know there's uh there's a lot to be said and so the whole subject of raw foods i think is is important for anybody to explore but it's not the end all be all it's like you a know? foundation it's a great foundation you know it's a and it's and it's definitely gonna um boost nutrient density um it's gonna uh, reduce uh the amount of carcinogens um it's gonna uh, reduce a lot of, um, you know, waste and toxic load. Um, but, you know, like I said, some things need to be cooked, they say, to, to release nutrients. So, like I said, there's, it's, it's always a gray area when it comes to food and diet. The most important thing is the love. Yeah. And I would say no matter what diet you subscribe to, chocolate, raw chocolate, sacred chocolate is part of a balanced, healthy diet, no matter what. Even if you're a breatharian, I'd say it's still, you know, it's still find a way, find a way, inject into your veins, whatever you need to do, because I think that that, that holds the keys uh, from my own experience. I think all the breatharians eat chocolate anyways. They just eat it <laughs> in a quantum form. Ah, uh, yeah. That, <laughs> oh, man, that didn't take me on a whole tangent. Steve, this has been absolutely amazing. Let's... Um, how do people get a hold of uh, sacred chocolate? Are there any particular, is there any, anything that we can give people information, opportunity bundles? Um, I know that I got my partner a beautiful um, care package that you guys do with the heart and you do this whole kind of care package for, for lovers. Um, so let's, let's tell people about their options and how to get on board with it. Sure. Um, you know, we're mostly distributed in small little health food stores uh, around the country. Um, you know, we were a little bit in Canada and the UK. Um, and uh, you can always buy us online, of course, sacredchocolate.com. Subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which you can find on our website. Uh, we do put out promotions from time to time. In fact, we're about to put one out. Um, so we offer discounts through our newsletters. Um, so I would definitely, if you're interested in buying our products and getting a good deal, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and then there are other, um, online, uh, portals as well. Uh, my partner, David Wolf sells it on his website, davidwolf.com. We sell our chocolate also on amazon.com and, um, you know, there are probably a few other online outlets that I'm not, not completely aware of that sells our, our products. You just have to search online. I think Vita Cost and, you know, and uh, Lucky Vitamin and places Money like that um, sell us. So, so what's that? As well. I, put, I put it on my website as well. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah. I mean, sacredchocolate.com is the best, the best uh, option, I guess. It, well, it definitely is the best option. That's why that's why I keep harping on it all day, all day long. It is literally the best option. Thanks. And speaking of which, just for everyone that's listening right now, um, we had mentioned that um, Sacred Chocolate is in the, the invitation of um, the perfect investor that wants to get on board with the chocolate mission, saving the planet, because this is the only planet that has chocolate trees as far as we know. So before we go to Mars or whatever deal, maybe we can contact Elon Musk and let him know what the real deal is. Maybe he doesn't know because they don't have chocolate trees on Mars and I'm not interested in that. 
So we need to save this planet and this chocolate source. And uh, this is this is the first step to doing that. So uh, if anybody um, has that ability or is interested in that, email me or email Steve directly. And uh, we'd love to have that conversation. I feel part of this mission. I felt like ever since I met you and David Wolf and like the Fruit Tree Planning Foundation, I feel like I'm somehow like the universe pulled me into the whole thing. And it was like, look, these are things are already established. You don't have to build them. Just align with these guys and support them. And, and um, I, you know, it's been 10 years for me and I feel like just as part of it as ever. So. Well, thanks. I, I, I really appreciate you, Ronnie. And um, I feel that you are definitely part of it. You are definitely a torchbearer and um, leading the way, um, especially for your generation and generations beyond. Um, you know, so you're definitely, um, you know, a member of the cacao tribe, that's for sure. And, um, yeah, so everybody has their role to play. Like I said, we're just a bunch of actors on the stage and, um, you know, so long as we, um, continue to support each other, that's the most important thing. So, um, yeah, thank you for your work and thank you for having me on this podcast and, and getting the message out again, you know, um, and, um, I'm always happy to show up wherever I can. Um, to spread the message of love and raw cacao. So um, I'm sure we'll have many more of these podcasts in the future. I, yeah, I, I, I think so. This is my positive addiction. So uh, <laughs> more to come. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate our friendship and the work that, that you've done and all the, the, the cool talks that we've given together. I'm so grateful that you'll be um, reading the upcoming book, writing the forward for it. I can't wait to, to read all of what you, you gleam from it and put that out into the world and continue this mission. So yeah, much gratitude, my friend. Thank you. Blessings. Yes. Blessings. Thank you so much for all that and the opportunity to be of service. And, um, I love you and all the best, uh, with everything in your life. Many, many blessings.